All right. Our next um, speaker will be Bishop Matthew Kuka. And it's my turn now. Yeah, I'll, call, I'll call you. Do we have Bishop on? My Bishop, how are you this afternoon? I'm very good, but you have, and how are you? I've been calling and calling. You almost made me panic. I didn't, I didn't hear from you today, send text messages, until they told me you had already logged in. So my heart came back to rest. <laughs> All I'm right. Sure, I'm sure you knew, you knew I wouldn't be late. <laughs> All right. Bishop Kuga is the current bishop of the Catholic Diocese of Sokoto. Uh, he has vast years of experience working within the church, in the academia, and as a respected statesman in Nigeria. He is a PhD holder from the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies in 1990. He is also a senior Rhodes Fellow at Oxford University. As a statesman, he served notably as a member of the Human Rights Foundation Investigation Commission, the Federal Government of Nigeria, and the chairman of the Ogoni Shell Reconciliation Committee. And his discourse this afternoon will be how patriotism became a devalued currency in Nigeria. So I'll turn it over to you, Bishop. You got me a bit confused because I've you set up a Q and A uh, session, so uh, I've had to put my notes aside. But uh, and I think perhaps we can progress on that on that note by me just making some preliminary observations. And I think that they're not essentially different from what you have heard. And let me commend you and commend uh, everybody who has spoken so eloquently and so passionately. Uh, but I don't think that we can shy away from the, 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 the collective feeling of helplessness at how much we have achieved uh, and how little, let me put it that way, we have achieved based on what we consider to be our potential and our capacity. Clearly, I think every speaker has identified the reasons for our slowdown and they're tied to some of the things that uh, the, the, my, my brother, the Amy Alcano, was saying. Uh, and all the, you know, this theme has run across, you know, you know a lot of the conversations. Uh, also, what uh, Honorable, you know, uh, Sita was saying, namely our inability or willingness to really define uh, where we are going. Uh, are we on in a democracy? Are we practicing a feudal system? Is it a plutocracy? You know, we just have a total mixture of everything. Uh, but clearly, beyond just going through the cycles of, of, of elections uh, and electoral processes, I think that uh, even the most optimistic of Nigerians must concede that we are nowhere near coming to terms with the fine ingredients of democracy, which are largely and occasionally quite intangible. But these relate to how citizens feel about uh, their presence you know, in the country, how citizens feel about the nature of, the, of the, the, the capacity of the state to respond to their yearnings, how citizens feel about the, the, the nature of the playing field, and whether the goalposts are set in a way or manner that they can actually achieve their ultimate uh, best. Clearly, um, as I said, beyond just the, the, the processes of going through cycles of elections, we have a very serious problem with, net, with, with you know, recruitment methods. Um, how do people get into public life? Uh, the points have been made, and I think that the first mistake we tend to make is to assume that um, these identities don't matter. The truth of the matter is that they do matter, and we can't run away from them. Identities matter, um, and clearly the, real, the responsibility of the state is not to deny this reality, because we often hear Nigerians pretend by saying rather hypocritically, oh, it doesn't matter where they come from as long as they perform. Uh, ordinarily, people think it matters, 
And I think it matters largely because the state itself has created that platform. Um, the responsibility of the state, if we have an aggregate of laws uh, that are applicable to everybody across the board, the first thing is that you will not stop people from aspiring to be what they want to be, i.e., I mean, what is wrong with me saying tomorrow I would like to buy an airplane? Um, the only concern for you would be where am I going to get the money from? But to make, to make that aspiration uh, in itself, there's nothing wrong with it. But when you have a country where, as I said, we are only nominally practicing democracy, um, and the reward system is skewed in a way and manner that office holders demonstrate very clearly that it matters. If you go to the villa today, and I have been, I've been to the villa a few times in the last uh, 20 or more years, and you know that in the, in the villa in Nigeria, you can always tell, and you see people changing their attire. You can, if you, if you go to the villa today, and you're wearing a Abada and Babariga, it helps. You speak Hausa, it helps. Even if you don't, you have to learn because that's the, 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 the cultural dynamics of the environment. If it was a few years ago, if you, if you wore a Niger Delta appearance because President Jonathan was there, you know, you'll see that the people who would work with the Swaka have been defined by that environment. And if it was a bus and it helped if you spoke Yoruba. So the fact of the matter is that we cannot deceive ourselves. First of all, uh, these cultural identities are not necessarily a negation of who we are. But because we don't have an overarching constitution uh, that can compel citizens to act in a common way, this is why we are a nation of competing citizenships and competing identities. Uh, up till today, the average Nigerian will probably give me the impression that, well, you know, if, if you make a law, it depends on what my religion says. If you make a law, it depends on what my culture will accept. And I don't think that we have uh, seen this in the way a manner that it has now come to the fore in the last five or so years. And citizens will respond and have this consciousness about who they are, depending on the reward system of the state. Now, as you can see, increasingly, um, different security outfits were set up by communities. Out of helplessness or hopelessness, the state has been compelled to co-opt all these you know, security agencies into the mainstream uh, security architecture. This is coming with consequences. Citizens across the board are struggling to find out how they can protect themselves. Because, I mean, this is the only country where, for example, and I think Osita spoke to this issue very finely, you know, you can get a first class degree and have one or two young men, you know, who have come up with fantastic reward, you know, fantastic degrees, petroleum engineering, uh, any other angle, you know, of, of the oil industry. But can they come anywhere near NNPC where they believe that their, their paper qualification qualifies them to contribute to Nigeria? It's not going to happen. Um, increasingly, the bureaucracy is defining itself in that way and manner. And there are, there's no time in our history that this consciousness has hit us as a result of government policies as we have today. And the, the, the evidence is there, the facts are there, that this government has been operating in total violation of the, process of, of the provisions of the Constitution as they regard for, the, I mean, as they relate, for example, you know, to the federal character, which in this way was never really a bad thing. It is very clear to us in Nigeria that almost every part of the country can produce the kind of manpower that we expect. But when you have a government clearly pursuing policies that favor particular genders, favor particular people based on certain identities, naturally ordinary citizens become very conscious of themselves, even if they weren't thinking in that way. You know, so if you enter a classroom, for example, and you are, you are, you are a Yoruba man or you are a team man, and the first young man who greets you, he greets you in vernacular, you know, and you respond with a smile, and somebody else greets you, and you, 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 know, you barely respond. Gradually, people begin to get, you know, to get the impression that if they want to catch your attention, they must speak the way you speak. So I make the point, you know, that patriotism has become a devalued currency precisely because the Nigerian state itself has just not had the capacity, you know, to, 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 to take advantage of the enormous energy that we have in this country. This is a country where 
who is going to be president tomorrow, we don't know. And it's not hard work that will make you president. Who is going to be governor of Nigeria, to, of, of this, that, or the other state tomorrow, we don't know because it's not your hard work that will make you governor. Now, if you have this system where, you know, um, we don't know what the rewards will be. It's like buying a ticket and going to, you know, to a football match. You enter the stadium and you suddenly realize there are players, but there are no goalposts. <laughs> Everybody will either go home because we have no football to play, because without goalposts there can be no game. You know, so the point I'm making is that increasingly, you know, and I've had a lot of friends over the last years who have been visibly patriotic, ready to defend government. But no sooner are they thrown out of government that they become critics of government. So, by way of may opening up the conversation, it is to say that right now, government policies have forced citizens to become very conscious of who they are. And I don't want to single out particular issues, you know, so that I don't sound personal. But how did we come to a point, for example, in which, <clears throat> as I said, in the same country, in Nigeria, if you remember, in the, in, the, in the life of the, is it the Seventh Assembly? Yes, I think it's the Seventh Assembly. You know, when, uh, uh, you know, I think um, you had a situation where uh, Senator David Mack was the Senate President, and then, uh, um, what's her name? Patricia Ete was the, well, you know, was the Speaker. And then Jonathan was President. And there was a move in the National Assembly, and that move had nothing to do with there was a dubious group that called itself integrity group, but they, they had anything but integrity. The person they targeted to get out of, of our position was Patricia Ete. And what was the real, the real reason, finally, it became clear to everybody, was that Patricia Ete had to go because people didn't think that, oh, why will a president be, be a Christian? And the Senate, president, the, the Senate president is a Christian, and the speaker is a Christian. And to make matters worse, let me put it that way, oh, she's a woman. Now, of course, Patricia Ike was eased out. My good friend Bankole became speaker with impeccable credentials, but that's not the point. Now, Bankole became a speaker not because he was the most qualified, of course he had all the, he had, he had all the credentials, but the only thing that qualified him for the position was that he was Muslim, because the Muslims felt that the, the, the dice was skewed against them in the, in the sense that the president is a Christian, the senior president is a Christian, and then the speaker is a, is a Christian. And don't forget, at the end of the life of that, of, you know, of that National Assembly, the same members of the House of Assembly decided on their own to say at their final sitting that Patricia Ete had not committed any crime, but that she had been served, she had been a lamb, a lamb of sacrifice. And the evidence is there for everybody to see. Now, how did we come to a, a situation as the one we have today, in which the president is a Muslim, the stainless president is a Muslim, the, the speaker is a Muslim, the majority leader is a... You, you can run the entire system. And you ask yourself, why would you do this and then pretend that religion doesn't matter? Ordinary citizens may have lived with this because they felt religion didn't matter. But when you twist the car in another way, you create an identity consciousness that probably was not there before. So this is why moving forward, this country must become a little bit, you know, uh, you know, we, especially we are the receiving end, because patriotism is not a commodity of exchange. It's not something that you simply assume you can measure. You can measure patriotism. But unless we have clearly defined goals, that if you do this, this is what you're going to get, and that if you get a first class, this country must, it, it, even if it doesn't give you a job, it must recognize that you have excelled. That if you have a country where we, are, we claim to be in a democracy, but we are literally at best managing a feudal system with a skewed reward system that focuses on blood, on lineage. You have no claims to be a democracy. So when you, when you, go, when you look at the, at the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, you know, section 14 in chapter 2, and you ask yourself, the constitution says eloquently, very clearly, the composition of any arm of government. Of, of, of people who serve in government must reflect the federal character. Reflecting federal character, many people have tended to make it look as if, oh, it is evidence that you are lowering the standards and so on. That's really not the issue. It is, in my view, reflecting the federal character is simply another way of saying that looking at ourselves in a mirror. And reflecting that federal character, we have skewed it to include region and religion. 
But if you don't include what the Emir of Kano was saying, are there men and women with disability who are part of our community in Nigeria? Where are they? There are many young people in Nigeria. Where are they? There are women making massive contributions. Where are they? Now, federal character is meant to say that we look at ourselves in the mirror, we can recognize ourselves, celebrate our diversity because the table is big enough to take everybody. But when you don't have that, and you put all the apples in one cart, naturally, you cannot lay claim you know, to violating the constitution and still insisting that we're in a democracy. So clearly, I'm, I'm, you, know, I'm, I'm, you know, perhaps I need, I, I need to begin to round off here. It is to say that this president, in my view, in the last few years, has made it very difficult for us to celebrate diversity. Very, very difficult. And I think that unless like, even the worst hypocrite in Nigeria will concede that a reward system that is so skilled, whether it's in favor of men or women or Christians or Muslims or whatever, is unacceptable. Because when it was time to vote, all of us went out to vote. We made a contribution. We expected certain outcomes. And the reason why election, election, electoral processes, Dr. Kolade was making the point, why can you not just vote and go home? You cannot just go and vote and go home because the political elite, the reward system has been created and skewed in a way and manner that voting and going home is almost the same as this. it's a matter of life and death. Because the government is showing you very clearly that, of course, President Buhari said, you know, in, in, in 2011, he said, okay, you vote, you stay, you protect your vote. The question is, what do we mean by protecting your vote? But the point is, our elections will continue to be violent because people get a feeling that if your man is not ill, if your woman is not ill, you don't have a chance. So today, there are many communities, they have a road simply because they happen to have the right person in power. They have a school in their village simply because they have the right person in power. You know, they are likely to get this, that, or the other reward simply because they have their people in power. Now, if you take my state, Kaduna, for example, and you ask yourself, you know, with all the element, with, you know, with all the eminently qualified people in southern Kaduna, we don't have a single person, you know, I mean, I mean, who is serving as a minister or holding any federal position. Now, when you have a system of business, you have to ask yourself, is it, did I fail an exam? Are we a conquered people? Yet. If you are in a democracy, and if you are in a, if you if you are in a system that husbands resources on behalf of communities, you must make people. That's why the constitution talks about creating a sense of belonging. And so you can correlate violence in Nigeria with the realities that we are constantly facing every day. So for me, these are some of the issues, and that's why I said democracy has become a divine currency in Nigeria, precisely because the governments, successive governments, but even more so now has created an identity consciousness that is dangerous to national unity, is dangerous for national stability, and is going to make the next election and the you know, successive government very difficult because is the next president of Nigeria going to make sure that all the security chiefs are from, uh, you know, are Christians? Is the next uh, president of Nigeria going to empty people out of customs, out of uh, 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 NNPC, and out of all these other places? So if we don't have a system where you know when you have passed an examination, you will not appreciate why you have failed the examination. So for me, these are the issues. I think we all love our country. You go back, and I've gone back and read several the speech delivered by our beloved prime minister. And you hear what the prime minister was saying in 1960. The international community stood shoulder to shoulder. You read the speech, go the, you, know, you can see the, you know, in YouTube the visit of our Prime Minister to the United States of America and how he was received. You, know, you can see all the promises. On the 5th of December, uh, 1960, Time Magazine decided to make Tafa Balewa our, you know, a man of the year, showing very clearly that the rest of the world wanted to lift up Nigeria so Nigeria can occupy a leadership position. Increasingly, our capacity to manage ourselves is diminishing by the day. Um, citizens' commitment to building a nation is diminishing by the day. The integrity and legitimacy of the state and its willingness to protect citizens is coming increasingly under question. So it is that without an aggregate of interest that people see a reflection of themselves in what the nation, you know, pretends to represent, you are not going to have people going in the same direction. And gradually, you are going to face whether 
after violence or voter apathy, because all these things, unless you create a situation in which ordinary citizens feel, we will never arrive at the finishing post at the same time. It's not possible. But every a system must be of such a nature that it, it rewards you according to your competence and your capacity. The number of, okay, we are talking about billions of dollars coming into Nigeria, you, you know, by, by, way, you know, by way of remittances. These are Nigerians who should be here having, you know, helping to develop this country. A friend of mine with two children who have got really fantastic education. I was talking to the children the other day in New York, and I said, look, when are you guys going to come home? And they said to me, they said, Bishop, we are not coming home because we don't have any senator in our family, because we don't have a chance. And so you have a situation where the best brain, the guarantee of the future, our youth have become resentful, not because they don't love the country, but because the country has not shown them any evidence that it takes them sufficiently seriously. So for me, as I said, we, we, we need to very quickly reset the template, you know, if we are to take our place after 60 years of independence. Still unable to provide our people water, we don't have food, we don't have life, we don't have security. 60 years after independence, it's a tough call. And I've prayed for Nigeria this morning, but I know that I speak for millions of other Nigerians. I am not a happy Nigerian, but I'm a very hopeful Nigerian. Thank you, Bishop. Um, where do you think that we went off the rails in this country? Where, where did we digress? Because it wasn't like this in this. Where, where, where do you think what happened? It wasn't like this before, but look, the first thing to say is that military rule did not help matters. It helped to, to destroy the foundations of the democratic ideals that were set. You know, in 1960, and if you have to talk to the scene of the crime, you have to go back to January 16. Whatever may be your sentiment, right or wrong, the fact of the matter is that that singular act of intervention destroyed the foundation of our, of our democracy. It whetted the appetite of the military, took them out of their of, of their constitutionally defined roles, and threw them into politics. And the next thing was we had years and years and years of democracy being in suspended animation, and then oil was discovered. And then suddenly the appetite and the gigantic greed of the military showed all schools and counter coups. And then the, the gradually state's creation, local government creation, become, became exercise in, 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 in appeasement of particular political elite. Today you hear people tell you, oh, I am the one who got this, that, or the other state. Or people tell you, I'm the one who got this, that, or the other local government area. We know very well, local government council were giving out to, to talk to members of the Supreme Military Council, literally as a donation, as a gift. The result is that unnecessary fault lines were created. So yesterday's minority became today's majority, replicating the same contradictions of conflict, domination, and so on and so forth. And increasingly, we had a very severe, deficient leadership with the mental capacity and reflexes to be able to think about the future. You know, when you look at the histories of nations, this nation building is not something you can, that, that is just based on a good heart. It's not even about, you may have integrity, but can you read the roadmap? Do you have an idea about where we are going, where you're taking your people to? So this lack of, even if you don't have, you can have unless you are sufficiently elastic. And this is where nepotism kills us. Because you don't open up the system in a way, a manner that people with competing narratives can find a seat at the table. So where things began to go wrong was the way the military itself, by killing democracy and diminishing the rule of law and glorifying the, the, you know, the rule of God, Increasingly, it was difficult for you, for the military, to find the right moral voice, you know, to condemn arm robbery, for example, because if an arm robber took you, you know, I mean, they set up military tribunals, but in reality, they ought to have been the ones, you know, facing the tribunals, because if you are asking somebody to get to, to be tried because he stole with a gun, you came to power with the baron of a gun. So increasingly, and I think that a lot of this is still in our politics today. This is why you find the politicians themselves have not developed enough reflex to be able to accept outcomes because with this military logic you are either in or you are out you know so if you ask where did it begin to go wrong increasingly by the 70s and the early 80s we see the military gradually denigrating intellectualism we see the military suspending and terrorizing and intimidating you know the university community to the point that thinking became a problem for nigeria and no nation in the world has ever grown without the robust 
a robust intellectual culture. So this is why, if you ask where did it begin to go wrong, this is where it began to go wrong, because processes for electing leaders were no longer clear. Um, and when we talk about the Asian Tigers, you know, you can correlate all this with, with, with the way that leaders were chosen. You cannot think about South Korea, I mean, sorry, uh, um, Singapore, for example, or even South Korea, without coming to terms with the, the nature of the intellectual equipment that these people had are brought to bear. Lee Kuan Yew talks very clearly about how seriously he took the civil service. You know, which kind of people ended up in the civil service? Because one of the most important institutions in any country is the quality of the civil service, because it is the conveyor belt for offering services and so on and so forth. But which kind of people have ended up in our bureaucracy? Which kind of people have ended up in the military? Which kind of people have ended up in the security services? Which kind of people have ended up in the... You know, when you ask these questions, you realize that if we have not invested in the right places, and I think this is what Nigeria's history suggests, we shouldn't be surprised at the outcomes that we have had. So again, as I said, democracy offers us an opportunity. But once we begin to imbibe the principles of democracy, and we're grateful to God that we've had five back-to-back -back elections, this is definitely the way to go. There's no alternative to democracy. But the political class in Nigeria must make democracy, must, must make politics a vocation with nobility, must make public service something to be taken sufficiently seriously, not the kind of skewed and criminal reward system that it has become today. And I think your speakers, including those who have served in government, have come to terms with those realities. Thank you very much, Bishop. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you Thank so you much, you sir, for contributing. Thank you for thoughts. delaying my lunch. Yes, <laughs> happy, happy, happy independence to you and everybody. God bless Nigeria. All right, sir.